Good morning. You're about to hear, Here, O oh my Lord, I see thee face to face. Here in this church, O oh my Lord, I see thee face to face. Thank you, Chris, for that wonderful gift and for sharing it with us and leading us into worship this day. So wonderful that you almost forget why we're here and what we need to do because it fills you so much and leads us to Jesus. We thank you. 
So welcome to worship this day. We are so grateful to have everyone here. We do have some announcements that we'd like to point out. There are activities happening in the life of this congregation. We point you to our Wednesday email for the latest information. And I'd like to highlight a few things with regard to worship. The drive-in service will end our season uh, the end of October. We do uh, give thanks to Lori and to Frank for their wonderful gift of hospitality, uh, for their grace and for their kindness in allowing us to be uh, at their space, weather permitting, every Sunday since May, which is amazing. Um, on November 1st, Bill Henderson will preach at our regular 9 o'clock time uh, here on our YouTube channel. And then on November 8, we will move our time and a bit of our, um, a bit of our format to 9.15. We'll have a time of announcements and a time of contemplation, a time of getting ready for worship, which will commence live on our YouTube live channel. You'll find us there at 9.30. We'll have a time of worship, uh, of joy, of remembering God's faithfulness together as a community of faith. Please be aware that there will be some Zoom uh, watch parties set up so you may see other folks on your screen even as you watch our service online. We are excited to bring that to you so we may foster our sense of community together. And with that, let us put aside our announcements. Let us call ourselves to worship using Psalm 99. The Lord is king. Let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim. Let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion. He is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. Mighty king, lover of justice, you have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Extol the Lord our God. Worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Let us worship our God. Let us pray. The Lord our God, your desire for us, your children, is that we be made holy, set apart. We thank you for your faith in us, your hope for us, which far exceeds our own faith in or hope for ourselves. We thank you as well for the guidance you have given us, the laws and statutes and commands that show us the way that explain your will. And we thank you for those to whom you have given your words, the prophets who risked so much and endured so much in order to live into the call you placed upon them. We have not always been grateful, and we have not always been willing. Yet you remain faithful and hopeful that we will receive with receptive spirits that which will help us to live well with you and one another. It is quite the treasure. It is all the wealth we need. We are grateful. Amen. Good morning, church. Chris, I have a question for you. Sometimes I just, like, want to feel closer to the Lord. I know how much good he does in my life, and I know when I'm close to him, I really experience that. I wonder if there's any song that would uh, address that. Anything come to mind? Hmm. I think I got a little something. Good. Let's see. I am weak, but thou art strong. I think you know this one. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. You don't want to be wrong now. I'll be satisfied as long as I walk. Let me walk close to thee. You can sing it with us. Just a close walk with thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. Through this world of toils and snares if 
if I falter, Lord, who cares? Who with me my burden shares? None but Thee, dear Lord, none but Thee. Just a closer walk with Thee. Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. When my feeble life is o'er, time for me will be no more. Safely o'er to thy kingdom shore, to thy shore. Just a closer walk with thee. Oh, you're singing along now at home. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily, daily walking close to thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be, dear Lord, let it be, dear Lord, let it be. All right. Friends, we do desire a closer walk with Jesus, and Jesus desires a closer walk with him. And in order to do that, we boldly proclaim all that we have done and said and thought, which is contrary to God's will, which harms our relationships with God and with one another, and even with God's entire creation. We need not fear because Jesus is our judge, and we know that Jesus is merciful beyond any imagination. And so in that courage, in that sense of peace, let us pray. Lord of all, incline your ear to us as we gather before you with contrite hearts, weary spirits. We are tired of carrying the weight of our lives. We are exhausted from trying to understand the world. We are spent from so much striving which never fully fulfills us. We struggle to make sense of it all. We have nothing left for you, for ourselves, for anyone else. We do not know what to do except to reach out to you whose embrace is always near. Gather us into your arms. Forgive our attempts to live according to our desires. Restore our souls and help us to bear spiritual fruit when you have made us ready. Hear us now as we share with you what you already know and have redeemed. And the people said, Amen. My friends, May the God of mercy who forgives all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit keep us in eternal life. Remember always that in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And in that gratitude and thanksgiving, we know that we are reconciled not only with God but with one another. And so in that reconciliation, let us proclaim that the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. So, our first reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah. Hear the word of the Lord. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their way and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them return to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. 
and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. And from the gospel of Jesus Christ, according to his beloved friend, John, hear these words. After this, Jesus went to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, also called the Sea of Tiberias. A large crowd kept following him because they saw the signs that he was doing for the sick. Jesus went up the mountain and sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, the festival of the Jews, was near. When he looked up and saw a large crowd coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, Six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, gather up the fragments left over so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up. And from the fragments of the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they began to say, this is indeed the prophet who has come into the world. When Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, got into a boat, and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were terrified. But he said to them, It is I. Do not be afraid. Then they wanted to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the land toward which they were going. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, we are in the midst of our encounter with Jesus, according to his dear friend John. Last week, we learned that Jesus is on a bit of a healing spree. First, the Roman official son, merely because the father, in his desperation, travels from Capernaum to Cana to ask Jesus for healing help. Jesus says, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. To which the official replies, please come with me and restore my son. Recognizing the man's faith, Jesus sends him on his way with the promise his son will live. Jesus heads to Jerusalem. On the outskirts of town, Jesus stumbles across the pool of Bethesda, where those who are very ill wait for the water to move in the hopes of being cured. There, Jesus encounters a man so poorly he has tried unsuccessfully for 38 years to make it into the pool first. Jesus tells him, get up, pick up your mat, and start walking. 
The man does as Jesus says. In the wake of that miracle, Jesus has quite the conversation with Jewish, Jewish authorities, declaring his relationship to God as God's son, risking his very life doing so. We arrive at today's gospel reading. Jesus has left Jerusalem, putting the Sea of Galilee between him and certain death. A crowd, desperate for hope in the midst of so much that is difficult, has begun following him. We don't know where they come from, or what they want, or even if they know this is Jesus. We only know that this great multitude of people understands this man heals, and comforts, and teaches. They have seen the signs they seek. They have dropped everything, and they have begun walking. In the process, the people have forgotten what they need, but Jesus hasn't. As the crowd grows larger, Jesus makes his way up a mountainside, sits down, and ponders the situation. And then he asks Philip a question. Where are we to buy bread for these people to eat? Philip, becoming very anxious, answers not where, but how. It will cost us six months' wages to buy enough for everyone to eat just a little. Andrew, trying to help, shares that he has seen a small boy carrying five barley loaves and two fish. There is food, but there is too little. What will we do? Jesus tells his friends, spread yourselves out and ask everyone to sit down. There are, by all accounts, 5,000 people gathered. There are a handful of disciples. There is one Jesus sitting high up on a hill. In the crowd below, I imagine a lot of milling about, a lot of children running, a lot of conversation. What's going on? Do you see anything? What is he doing now? Has he healed anyone else? Tell me again what you saw, what you heard. Can he really be the one we are waiting for? Why has he stopped? What are we to do for dinner? Should we leave? This may be our only chance to be healed. As the disciples make their way around, I picture them looking at each other, many questions whispered. What is Jesus up to? How will we get everyone to sit down and be still? What will happen if the people become impatient? How will we feed them? Why has Jesus placed us in such an untenable position? Eventually, Jesus' beleaguered and confused friends quiet the crowd. It is then that Jesus stands. Everyone turns to look as Jesus holds up a piece of bread and blesses it just like at the Passover meal. Jesus places the bread and fish in baskets, directing his friends to hand them out, inviting everyone to tear off whatever they need to eat to be full. The few baskets begin their trek around this massive crowd. Those sitting grow hushed, wondering how so few loaves of bread, how two small fish can keep feeding so many people. It becomes improbable, then impossible, then miraculous. On and on, person after person, the baskets keep going. The same food keeps getting broken, shared, eaten. No one stops watching. There is murmuring, growing louder and louder, then softer, then silence. It is another sign. This is the one. The disciples who watch Jesus turn water into wine are wide-eyed. This is not what they expected. If left in their hands, they would likely have said, this is pure craziness. Let's send everyone home to eat their own food. They would likely have said, we need a better plan. Let's form a subcommittee to consider all options. 
They would likely have said, there are too many people here. Let's split up the crowd, feeding a group at a time while we try and locate something else to eat. They would likely have said, well, next time we'll be more prepared. We'll ask for donations, then send word to the next town to make sure plenty of food is available, packaged to go. They would likely have thought and said and done all sorts of things that would have taken away from this most holy, incredible moment. But they don't. Instead, the disciples put aside their doubts, their questions, their ideas, their need to take over, and they trust. They work together. They serve everyone. They try something so outrageous it defies belief, resting in the sure knowledge that Jesus is all and able and complete. It is not yet finished. With everyone content from eating the same food, sitting in one large gathering, watching and sharing and laughing and marveling together, Jesus says to his friends, gather up everything left over so nothing is left behind. The disciples do as Jesus asks, picking up the baskets, 12 full, and bringing them to Jesus so everyone may see. First quiet, then a proclamation. He is indeed the prophet who has come into our world to reign over us. Jesus turns and heads further up the mountain by himself. He is not an earthly king, so he shall not allow them to make him one. Now, this to me is where the text gets interesting. Jesus has left his friends. Evening arrives. The crowd has settled down for the night. And so what did the disciples do? They leave in a boat to cross to the other shore without Jesus. It is late and it is dark. The fishermen and the group are rowing. Suddenly the wind picks up. This must be a surprise as those who spend their lives on this very sea are used to discerning the weather's mood. Conditions worsen. The waves swirl, crashing against the boat. The landlubbers begin to panic. They are miles from any shore, too far away to do anything but keep going. The fishermen strain, fighting the strength of the water. They wonder if they will survive. They have forgotten what they have learned about signs, about belief, about being still about miracles taking place without Jesus even being present. And then there is Jesus, without a word or warning, walking, heading near them. This is way beyond inviting someone to drop everything and go, or making wine, or healing bodies or commanding someone to pick up a mat and walk, or increasing bread and fish. This is terror and confusion and disbelief. And all Jesus says to this motley band of regular guys is, it is I, the Son of God, fear not. Be not afraid of great waves and fierce wind that could overturn your vessel. Be not afraid of a noisy, hungry multitude who could use some food even more than healing. Be not afraid of person after person suffering in every way imaginable. Be not afraid when the storms of life emerge out of nowhere, threatening to undo you. Be not afraid. For I will help you. Be still, for you are not alone. I am with you. Which, in the end, is sign enough, isn't it? There is a story from China 
as told to Carl Jung by theologian and Chinese scholar Richard Wilhelm, which expresses this well. It is called the Rainmaker and has been adapted and retold many times over since Jung first heard it in the 1920s. Here is Dr. Irene Claremont de Castillo's consideration. In a remote village in China, a long drought had parched the fields. The harvest was in danger of being lost and the people were facing starvation in the months to come. The villagers did everything they could. They prayed to their ancestors. Their priests took the images from the temples and marched them round the stricken fields. But no ritual and no prayers brought rain. In despair, they sent far afield for a rainmaker. When the little old man arrived, they asked him what he needed to affect his magi, and he replied, nothing, only a quiet place where I can be alone. They gave him a little house, and there he lived quietly, doing the things one has to do in life. And on the third day, the rain came. This, to me, is, a is as profound a story as any parable of Christ and sets an example and an ideal which is a salutary complement to our Western passion for activity. If only we could be rainmakers, those people who go about their ordinary business with no fuss, yet around whom things happen. Indeed, these rare people around whom life blossoms cannot be said to cause the blossoming. The rainmaker of the story did not cause the rain to fall by the exercise of any supernatural, supernatural power. The rainmaker does not cause. He allows the rain to fall. The rainmakers among us are still as they wait for God to do what God will. Heal and restore and gather so nothing may be lost. Jesus, the great rainmaker, shows us how. While sitting on a hillside, while watching his friends chase after stray children and round up unruly people, while standing up and praying a blessing over a single loaf of bread, while walking slowly through a tumultuous storm as his friends engage in battle with it. In all ways, Jesus is present, Jesus is still, Jesus is quiet, Jesus is at peace. And Jesus asks us to be at peace when all we want to do is succumb to our pain, our fear, our disbelief, our doubts. Jesus asks us to quiet ourselves when all we want to do is take charge, thinking that we alone may solve every problem we encounter. Jesus asks us to be still as we sit in God's comforting presence, allowing God's healing help to rain down upon us, all of us, so we may be found. We may not always believe it. We may not always see the signs. That is understandable. When that happens, consider again the word of the Lord as conveyed to the prophet Isaiah. For as the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return there until they have watered the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and succeed in the thing for which I sent it. For God's thoughts are not our thoughts, and God's ways are not our ways. God's are higher and better and more perfect. In this we may believe, and in this we may receive peace. In this we may be gathered into God's loving embrace. Thanks be to our great rainmaker. Amen.
This next song, Give Me Jesus, was written and sung by slaves in the pre-Civil War South. These are people who knew suffering like none of us know. And Jesus was enough for them. And that's the same Jesus that Pastor Kim just talked about, the one who walked on the water, the one who fed the 5,000. He was enough, and he is enough for us. Give us Jesus. In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus. You can have all world, but give me Jesus. And when I am alone, oh, and when I am alone, and when I am alone, give me Jesus. Give me Jesus, give me Jesus, you can have all this world, give me Jesus. We have been given the great gift of Jesus. We get to glory in that. We have heard the word proclaimed. We have heard the word sung. Let us affirm what we believe this day using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, forgiveness of sins, and the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. One of our other great gifts is to, uh, that in relationship with God, we are able to enter into God's presence. We are able to speak to God whatever is on our hearts, whatever is on our minds, even all the things that we cannot put into words, for we know that God receives everything. God is with us always. God desires to hear from us. In that wonderful spirit, then, let us pray. 
Loving God, we lift our voices and call upon your precious name, for we are in such great need. Our minds are troubled, our hearts are rent, our spirits are overcome, our bodies are exhausted. We have nothing left but worry and fear and grief. We need your refreshing, restoring, sustaining spirit to fill us and to uphold us and to remind us that you are God. Your ways are far greater than any storm we encounter. Your thoughts are far deeper than any concern we consider. Your hopes and dreams and joys are far higher than anything we can place in their way. For you are the one who conquers the grave, who heals our hurts, who satiates our hunger, who endows us with purpose. This day, remind us all. Surround us with your peace. Gather us into your presence. Restore us to your shining creation. And loving God, take from us our fear and replace it with your power. For you are holy, and holy is your name. We pray this in all our prayers in the name of the one who taught us how to pray to you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our God is gracious and generous, always present, always providing. Everything that is good comes from God, and we rejoice we are to be thankful and obedient in our thanks by returning to God a portion of what God has given to us, what God has entrusted to us, so that we may be faithful in the call that God has placed upon us to be God's hands and feet in our world, to support God's work that carries on right now, this minute. Let us consider the ways that we may be able to return to God what God has given to us, whether time or talents or treasure, all the ways that we are asked to contribute, to support one another, to give back. And in that consideration, let us pray this prayer of blessing upon those gifts. Gracious and glorious God, we thank you for your gifts that provide for our every need. We ask that you bless our offerings, everything, given with gratitude, so all around us, in our community, in our world, may know your love. Amen. There's something wonderful about knowing that we are singing the same songs that our brothers and sisters hundreds and even thousands of years before sang at least some of the same words a lot of these come from the psalms and praise to the lord the almighty this one is hundreds of years old and we can join with our brothers and sisters who have sung this song in countless places praising our lord almighty to you, the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. O oh, my soul, praise Him, for He is thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw near. Praise Him in glad adoration. Lord. Praise the Lord, He is here. Praise the Lord and draw near. Praise to the Lord who o'er 
where all things so wondrously reign and shelters thee under his wings, yea, so gently sustain and hast thou not seen how thy desires have been granted in all he ordained? Praise the Lord, yes, he reigns. Praise the Lord, he sustains. Praise to the Lord who let all that is in me adore him. All that hath life and breath come now with praises before him. Let the Amen sound from his people again. Gladly for all we adore him. Praise the Lord we adore. Praise him forevermore. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The great rainmaker remains with us, asking us to be still to be at peace as God accomplishes God's will through us, inviting us to be part of God's work in the world. It is a wonderful, wonderful place to be. We are grateful for that trust. And now, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit surround and carry us into the world this day and always. Amen. Thank you.